Welcome back to a brand new semester of G Week. We hope you've all had a great break. For our first episode of the semester, we'll dive into updates on GW's new moniker and the latest on DC statehood. We'll also get a chance to cover President Biden's State of the Union address and the Turkey-Syria earthquake. Thanks for tuning in. More to come. Welcome back to the show. I'm Morgan Miller, and please join me in welcoming our brand new anchor, Emma Grace Myers. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to join G Week as an anchor this semester. There's been no shortage of news, so let's get right into it. Last Tuesday, more than 73 million people watched as President Joe Biden delivered his second State of the Union. Biden's remarks emphasized hot topic issues like COVID-19, inflation in the economy, semiconductors, and drug price controls. Biden also emphasized bipartisanship and optimism throughout his speech. However, some members of Congress contrasted this message. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is widely known for her far-right views, stood up at one point during the speech and yelled, quote, liar, end quote. According to the New York Times, Biden's speech was, quote, punctuated by outbursts, jeers, and peals of mocking laughter. But Mr. Biden turned the tables on his Republican opponents and argued in real time with the insurgents. It appeared to be the start of his reelection campaign, end quote. As the new year began, a tragedy unfolded in Pokhara, Nepal, after Yeti Airlines Flight 691 crashed into a gorge on January 15th. With at least 69 fatalities identified, the victim's loved ones are grieving this unfortunate circumstance. Praveena Katka has the story. The domestic flight had originated from Kathmandu Tribhuvan International Airport at 10.33 that morning with 72 passengers and four crew for initial flight time of only 25 minutes. As the plane neared Pokhara, the captain of Flight 691 was noted to have contacted air traffic control to request a change in runway from runway 30 in the west to runway 12 in the east. It is currently unknown if this had any direct effect on the cause of the crash. Co-pilot Anju Katiwada perished in the crash with the remaining passengers. The Washington Post confirms, quote, she had lost her husband, who was also a pilot in another Yeti Airlines plane crash more than 16 years ago, end quote. Provided by flight training website Flight Radar 24, we know that the 15-year-old ATR-72-500 aircraft was transmitting inaccurate speed and altitude data as per information. Nonetheless, the airport in Pokhara was brand new at the time of the accident, having been opened only 13 days before the crash. This is another potential factor for the accident occurring. Nepal's dangerous weather conditions with low visibility and mountainous terrain creates numerous complications for aviators. With the help from French officials, the Nepali government is currently investigating the potential cause of this accident. We at GWTV send our heartfelt condolences to those impacted by the crash. For G Week, I'm Praveena Kodka. Thanks, Praveena. In November of last year, the free AI program ChatGPT was released, able to write essays and answer questions with prompts from users. Averaging 13 million users per day, according to CBS, the service has left school administrators unsure whether it could be used to cheat on academic assignments. Last month, GW faculty members met in Gelman Library to discuss the future of chat GPT, artificial intelligence, and schoolwork. While some faculty members were frightened at the challenges that the program may pose relating to academic honesty, others rejoiced at the opportunity to streamline quiz writing and lesson planning. A day-long conference on this topic titled, I Am Not a Robot, The Entangled Futures of AI and Humanity, is planned for April 14th. Back in 1926, GW changed its moniker from the buff and blue to the Colonials. Now, just under a century later, GW is once again reimagining what the mascot will be. There's been spirited debates from students, faculty, and community members alike. Preston Summit, who interviewed students in Kogan, has the story. The George Washington University mascot, the Colonials, has always been a point of discomfort for many students, especially students of color. GW Today reported that university officials are adding updated guidelines for new moniker submissions after input from nearly 4,000 GW community members had been collected as of January 18th. These guidelines relate to one of three themes, shaping the future, free to be bold, and at the center of power. GW also intends for the new moniker to exemplify electric, tenacious, and open personality traits. 
The university has also stated that any variations of HIPPO will not be considered because of its negative feedback during engagement events and from student athletes, as reported by GW Today. This is not the first time that GW has changed a prominent name due to public outcry. The Cloyd Heck Marvin Center changed its name in 2021 to the University Student Center due to controversy surrounding the namesake's support of segregationism. In fact, GW has received many other petitions for buildings to undergo name changes, such as Fulbright Hall, Madison Hall, the Churchill Center, and the Monroe Hall of Government. The Colonial's moniker specifically was announced to be discontinued in June 2022 after a recommendation from the Special Committee on the Colonial's moniker. GWTV traveled to Kogan Plaza to interview students about their ideas for the mascot change. What did you think about the Colonial's moniker? Um, not a fan. Um, I really wish we were the hippos. As you probably know, GW is changing its moniker from the Colonials to something else, as decided by the community. What were your thoughts on the original Colonials moniker? I mean, this might be controversial, but I like it. I like the logo. So, I mean, uh, I just don't want the hippos. That's all I mean. Okay. Fair, fair. What are your thoughts on the original Colonial moniker? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't see how. I mean, I understand what they're trying to do, but at the same time, um, I do think that it's just just a mascot. It's not anything really that deep to get into. They are not going to use the hippos or any variations of it because of negative polling from student athletes. But if you had another suggestion for what the moniker could be, what would you think? Oh, I'm pro the fog all the way. What do you like about it? I think it's silly. It's on brand, foggy bottom. I love it. GW closed the submissions on January 31st and stated that, quote, after evaluating all of the suggestions, we will present a short list of options for community feedback starting in February 2023, end quote. For GW TV and Kogan Plaza, I'm Preston Summon. Thanks, Preston. DC Metro employee Robert Cunningham is being remembered as a hero by the DC community after he died confronting a gunman who opened fire on a train platform. Cunningham, a mechanic at Metro for over 20 years, stepped in front of a woman who was approached by the gunman and attempted to intervene in the altercation. A day after the incident, bouquets and cards honoring Cunningham were left at the scene. Neighbors and friends spoke to the friendly and generous nature of Cunningham, with one neighbor telling the Washington Post, quote, I'm not surprised one bit that he would step forward, end quote. The Metro general manager, Randy Clark, also praised Cunningham's actions, but stated that, quote, the fact that our citizens have to intervene with armed gunmen is disturbing, end quote. There have since been calls for the metro station to be renamed after Cunningham. GW Program Board is hosting their annual Red Carpet Gala on Friday, February 17th at the National Portrait Gallery. The event is open to undergraduate and graduate students, alumni, as well as faculty and staff. According to the Program Board Engage page, it will be a, quote, night of dancing, music, desserts, and more, end quote. For anyone over 21, there is a private lounge, but you must have a valid government ID proving you are 21. To enter this lounge, you must purchase a drink ticket for $15, and the ticket allows you a maximum of two drinks. General admission tickets are being sold at $25 each on Ticketmaster, or for $22 if purchasing groups of 10 or more. As of February 9th, there have been 62 mass shootings in the United States, according to the Gun Violence Archive, encouraging officials in California to try and make changes to prevent that number from growing. Brooke Forget has the story. Following multiple shootings in January, California legislators are proposing new legislation that would ban carrying guns in almost all public places. According to AP News, quote, Churches, public libraries, zoos, amusement parks, playgrounds, banks, and all other privately owned businesses that are open to the public would be gun-free zones, even for people who have a permit to carry concealed guns, end quote. The legislation comes amidst a rise in gun prices in the United States. Only a few weeks ago, a shooter opened fire at a Lunar New Year celebration in Monterey Park, California, killing at least 11 and injuring nine. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated event. The Gun Violence Archive reports that over 600 mass shootings have occurred every year since 2020. And according to the BBC, 79% of all homicides are gun-related in the United States, 
as compared to the 4% in the UK, 13% in Australia, and 37% in Canada. However, despite intense debates and controversy over the issue, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act was enacted in 2022. The bill created stricter background checks for adults aged 18 to 21, as well as provided funding for various gun-related issues like mental health. In a statement on the legislation, Sandy Hook Province, a national nonprofit organization founded in Lent by the family members whose loved ones were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School in the 2012 mass shooting, stated, quote, we are, as always, grateful and full of hope. We're proud to have helped craft this historic package of common sense gun safety reforms and help take it across the finish line, end quote. But many have argued that there is still more to be done. Even though California has some of the toughest gun legislation, passing new legislation still proves to be a challenge. Last year, lawmakers failed to pass a similar proposal because they could not gain enough support. According to the Los Angeles Times, Sam Paredes, executive director, director of the Gun Owners of California, said that the proposed bill is unconstitutionally subjective and that the extensive list of prohibited places would make all of California a gun-free zone. Paredes plans to pursue the state of California if the bill gets signed into law. According to the Sacramento Bee, Governor Gavin Newsom of California said that the recent mass shootings have encouraged him to continue fighting to leave California a leader in gun control. Also according to the Sacramento Bee, Newsom said, quote, We're saving lives, but we have more work to do on this effort. End quote. For G Week, this is Brooke Fortune. Thanks, Brooke. On Monday, February 5th, an earthquake with a 7.8 magnitude struck Turkey and Syria. As of Friday, more than 22,000 people have been killed. The disaster particularly affected northern Syria, where there are already over 4 million Syrians waiting for humanitarian assistance. Fatma Demir, a survivor in Turkey, told officials, quote, When the quake hit, a concrete slab fell on top of me. I fell down to the floor. End quote. Demir was one of the two women found after 62 hours being trapped under piles of rubble and debris. A total of 70 countries, including the United States, United Kingdom, and the UAE, have offered relief to Turkey. 14 international organizations have also offered their support. A topic that has long been debated amongst government officials and local communities is D.C. statehood. While citizens are still upset with taxation without representation, their local officials continue to try to advocate for them. The fight for D.C. to be a state continues to gain attention. Katherine Saranchak has the story. It's the age-old question, should statehood be granted to D.C.? U.S. Senator Tom Carper certainly believes it should, as he and several Senate Democrats reintroduced a bill that would grant the district its statehood and position it as the 51st state. The District of Columbia was established in 1790 as the nation's capital, with federal jurisdiction granted to the U.S. Congress under the Constitution. The reasoning behind this push for statehood lies in concerns over taxation without representation. Carper and fellow Democrats urge that D.C. residents deserve local self-government and voting representation in Congress. Current D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser has voiced her support for the push for statehood, demanding two senator representation for the 700,000 Americans residing in D.C. Carpenter introduced legislation in 2013 to Congress in this ongoing petition for statehood. Residents of D.C. argue that it operates as a state and should therefore be considered as such. Not only does D.C. run its own school system and Medicaid programs, but residents also pay taxes, serve in the military and in juries, and vote in elections. Therefore, residents are seeking ample representation and a future where current D.C. Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton can vote on bills as a full member of the House. D.C. currently operates under the Home Rule Act that granted the district a mayor and its own legislative branch of local government, known as the Council. However, still lacking voting representation in Congress and trapped under the authority of Congress to review all the legislation passed by the Council, the next step in granting more just representation to the citizens of D.C. is passing the State of Washington, D.C. Admission Act in Congress, a feat that's proving difficult to accomplish. Thanks, Catherine. On February 4th, 2023, Airspace in North and South Carolina was closed to commercial aviation to allow the United States Air Force to shoot down a Chinese balloon that was first spotted off the coast of Alaska on January 28th. 
in what was first reported in the Billings Gazette following a February 1st spotting over the state of Montana, public and government attention became fixated on the possible national security risk, as well as the purpose of what the Chinese government claimed was a weather balloon. Nonetheless, despite initial political polarization on whether or not the balloon was a threat, President Biden eventually ordered the downing of the balloon after it was made clear that a shoot down over the ocean would prevent the possible injury of civilians on the ground. Currently, the salvaged debris from the balloon is being analyzed by the FBI. It has also been discovered that this is not the first time such a balloon has flown over the American continent. We are now joined by our brand new lifestyle correspondent, Thea Lawson, to give us the rundown of the films we should check out this Oscar season. Hey GW, if you're looking for something to watch after a long day of classes or need a break from the copious amounts of reading you've been assigned, the Academy of Motion Pictures recently released its picks for the best movies of the year with its nominations for the 95th Annual Oscar Awards. With the Oscars expecting to air live on March 12th, there's plenty of time to watch this year's hottest films and make predictions for the lucky winners. The Best Picture category is packed this year with popular blockbusters including Avatar, The Way of Water, Top Gun Maverick, and Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. Other exceptional films on the list include Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Banshees of Inner Sheeran, and Tar, which certainly deserve a watch if you haven't already. The award for Best Actor and Actress are always highly anticipated awards. Austin Butler and Colin Frazier for their respective roles in Elvis and The Banshees of Inner Sheeran. Michelle Yeoh was also scored a nomination for her head-turning role in Everything Everywhere All at Once accompanied by famous names like Kate Blanchett and Ana de Armas for their roles in Tar and Blonde. The 2023 Oscars will surely be one to remember, for better or for worse. Michelle Yeoh has made history as the first Asian American actress to be nominated for Best Actress. Angela Bassett also made history as the first actor from a Marvel Studios production to be nominated. On a more controversial note, Andrea Riseborough's nomination for Best Actress for Momentum Pictures to Leslie an independent film that achieved paltry box office success with only $27,322. Some of the biggest snubs of the year missing from the Oscars nominations include Any Woman from the Best Director category and popular movies like Jordan Peele's Nope and The Woman King starring Viola Davis, who recently became an EGOT with her Grammy win. I certainly have my work cut out for me this month trying to cram in as many of these Oscars nominated films as possible. You know, Thea, I keep telling myself I'm going to watch Elvis and then, I, and then I don't do it, but I have heard amazing things about Butler's performance in that one. Mm, same. My family keeps telling me I have to watch Banshees of Inner Sharon, but I heard it's pretty dark. Yeah. How about you, I don't Emma? know. The only one I've seen is Top Gun Maverick, um, which I got to admit, I'm a Miles Teller girly at heart. <laughs> How could you not be? How could you not be with the beach scene? But I definitely, I'm not a big movie girl, so yeah. I can't say that I will be watching a ton of these films. Yeah. You know, I'm excited to see Ana de Armas in the future. She's been fantastic in all of her work. Uh, Knives Out, I know she was in a few of the Spanish shows and movies I've oh, yeah. seen in the past. She's a fantastic actress. I can't wait to see what she does. Certainly. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Thea. The DC Hyde Act has been in place since June 1st, 1910. This act sets a maximum limit on Washington, DC's building heights. The limit is 130 feet on commercial streets and 90 feet on residential streets. The act itself was amended by President Obama back on May 16th, 2014. This amendment focused mainly on the part that dealt with penthouses as they could now hold more people with an occupancy of one to one. The current debate is that they want to raise the height to 160 feet. Mayor Muriel Bowser would like the focus to be on being able to reimagine the downtown area. The goal is to attract more residents to the area and help the architects that are designing buildings in that area. In a recent trip to Europe, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky asked for more military support in the form of fighter jets, which he called Ukraine's, quote, wings for freedom, end quote, when talking to the British Parliament on Wednesday. In response to this request, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak had pledged British support in training Ukrainian pilots to fly NATO standard aircrafts. When discussing sending fighter jets, Sunak said, quote, nothing is off the table, end quote. French President Emmanuel Macron also met with Zelensky on Wednesday and expressed similar sentiments, saying, quote, as long as Russia continues to attack, we will continue to adapt and moderate the necessary military support to preserve Ukraine and its future, end quote. 
As his trip came to a close, Zelensky met with members of the EU, thanking them for their support this year and requesting more support as the war in Ukraine continues. That's all for this episode. Thanks for tuning in. Signing off, I'm Emma Grace Myers. And I'm Morgan Miller. Until next time, GW. Thank you.